talk to you about a study that we actually published quite a few years ago, but I think it's, I think it's important. Um, one thing we're talking about is this metacognitive awareness and being able to think about your own thinking and understanding strategies. So there's a lot of strategies that we use every day that we probably take for granted and we just kind of assume are automatic processes. And one of those strategies is rehearsal. So there's a whole line of research in kids with Down syndrome showing that if you simply teach them how to rehearse information, their working memory improves. So we thought, let's do this with kids with FASD. So we replicated a study that was done in kids with Down syndrome. And we basically just looked at whether or not we taught them how to verbally rehearse information would improve their working memory. So we had young children aged 4 to 11. We wanted to have a range of kids that were um, below and above the age of when spontaneous rehearsal should be occurring. Okay? Um, and basically, we had an experimental group where we basically just taught them. I mean, it was within, it was like 15 minutes that we spent with them, teaching them how to rehearse information. Tell them, well, you, you know what works really well? If you repeat the information over and over in your head, you can even do it out loud. Doing it out loud is helpful as well. So actually saying that the numbers out loud is really helpful, that's fine. But repeat the information over and over, and you should have seen the looks on these kids' faces where they were like, really? I can, like that works? Almost none of the kids were doing this, which we found was phenomenal. It was just so interesting. And then we had a control group where they didn't receive the rehearsal training, and then we basically did basic working memory tests before and after, different versions of tests, and then we followed them up again after. Um, now, after the study, well, let me show you what we found. So we do see increases in their immediate working memory. So basically, it was just um, remembering lists of numbers. We would give them lists of numbers that started with two, that went to three, that went to four, until they could no longer remember them. And that's called a digit span test. And that's what we did. And we saw increases in their digit span in the experimental group from the pre-test, from the post-test, which was immediately after, and the post-test two, which was, we brought them back two weeks later to see whether or not any of those results were maintained. And look, we see a huge effect. There's a neurocognitive habilitation program. It's really um, an in intervention that's been done based on the alert program. Has anybody heard of the alert program? Oh, great. Okay, are people using it or? Oh, great. Okay, so the alert program was actually developed by occupational therapists um, and it focuses on emotional self-regulation and sensory processing. And I feel that self-regulation is it's part of executive functioning and it's really part of the core impairments in FASD. Not being able to regulate your behavior, whether or not it's behavior, emotional outbursts, self-regulation is a very important um, aspect of child development. And so what they did is they took that alert program and they studied it um, in children with FASD, age 6 to 11, and they randomly assigned them to either get an intervention, which was the alert program, and they did this in a group therapy, in a group setting. And they had the kids come into the lab, but they did it in a group. And, and so they had the researchers that were trained on the alert program. And it's my understanding that anybody can be trained on the alert program and can kind of use the principles and whatnot. You can go, you can Google alert program and you can go to the website and find out the information. It's a great program. And then they did 12 sessions and the control group received nothing. But they were able to show that after having this group therapy alert program, the kids with FASD were showing significant improvements in executive functioning, which is really important and also in their emotional problem solving so their ability to solve emotion-based problems so that was really interesting so there's a, a classic um, hot executive functioning test that um, was developed in the neuropsych research that's been around for a, decades and that is used a lot in the neuropsych research and it's called the iowa gambling test and it's a measure of decision making and it involves emotional aspects and i'll walk you guys through the test and how it works um, but, okay, so for, for this test, it, it's really getting at this hot aspect of the F. So participants are, are um, presented with uh, four decks of cards on a computer screen, and they're instructed that they need to choose um, from the cards, and based on when they flip over the card, it will tell them how much money they're going to win or lose, and they basically want to keep choosing cards to win as much money as possible, okay? So it turns out that out of the four decks, two of them are disadvantageous decks. So they have a lot of initial rewards, so they may get $200 or something, and then, but big losses. So choosing from those decks in the long run is not a good thing. And then two are advantageous in that they choose from the decks and maybe they don't make as much money each time, but they're losing less. This is a standardized test that is developed and well validated and out there. Um, 
And it's used a lot um, in criminal justice populations um, as measures of impaired decision making. And it's also used a lot in ne neuropsych populations. It's very sensitive to damage to the prefrontal cortex, and we know that the frontal lobe is involved in all of this um, executive functioning and decision making. So I was astonished when I came across this test that nobody had ever looked at this in FASD because I think that um, you know it's, it's measuring frontal lobe function, it's sensitive to decision making and this kind of hot aspect of, FA, of um, decision making and nobody had actually studied this in FASD. So we decided to do a study looking at this test with children and adolescents with FASD. So basically we um, looked at this test with 31 participants and 31 controlled participants aged 8 to 18. So you can use this across a wide age range. It's not normed for children. Um, you can use it with children. They love it. I mean, it, we, we tell them it's theoretical money. It's not real money or anything like that. And then every child at the end gets a $5 gift certificate, but they are motivated to um, to, to play the game and, and kind of go through the tasks. So, so remember, the most important thing is that you have a number of trials to choose decks from the cards. So at first, you may choose from the ones that are giving you a big reward, but a big loss. But over time, most people learn to switch their choosing to the other two desks, decks, because in the long run, it's giving them more money. So you, you think about it, it has to, you have to be able to inhibit that prepotent emotional response to want to go for the big, winning decks when you're going to be losing more and you have to kind of really think rationally and kind of plan ahead. So it really involves those key executive functions. So what we found, I think this is one of the most interesting figures that's, that, that, that we have in our labs. So um, this is just the number of trials. So within each block, there's like 20 trials. I think they've got 100 times that they can choose cards. And this is just their, 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 their total net score that they're gaining. And what we see here, so this is published um, in a journal just recently, is we see a really nice learning curve in controls. So as they go through the test, they realize, okay, yeah, this deck I'm losing too much money, and they learn to start choosing from the advantageous deck. And we see a, a perfect learning curve. But what we see in FASD is we see absolutely no learning curve whatsoever. We see a very flat level of performance. They don't learn from the past mistakes, and they, they continually to, continue to choose more from the disadvantageous deck. And they can't really inhibit that emotional kind of response to, and, and, and to think rationally that that deck is not getting them anywhere. Um, so we see very random or flat performance, but no learning curve. So this is pretty compelling. And then at the end, we see that if anything, they're getting worse. That could be, it could also be that they're getting bored with the test. But either way, we, we, you know, we don't see any learning curve. And I think this really, I think it just kind of highlights um, a lot of the, the everyday difficulties that we see in FBSD, that the inability to in inhibit and the difficulty with self-regulation and making appropriate decisions. Um, this study, we were looking at source memory. So what source memory is, is um, it's remembering the source of information. So remembering where you learn something. Um, so it's not necessarily remembering the material, but remembering who told you or where you learned it. And that's really important to be able to put information back in context and, and, and know if you learned that from your mom or your dad or, or who told you that information. Source memory research is actually um, used a lot in eyewitness testimony in children. So there's a whole line of research on this and there's um, very prominent researcher at the University of Victoria who, who studies uh, source memory. Sometimes they'll call it source monitoring. The terms are used interchangeably but it's remembering the source of information. So we already know that kids with FASD have a lot of difficulty with memory. We don't really need any more research on that. Um, I mean, research is great, but we know that pretty well. Um, we were interested in whether or not source memory or source monitoring was an impairment. Um, so there's three different types of source memory. There's external monitoring, and this is being able to remember um, between distinguish information between two externally derived sources. So did Mary say that or did Mike say that? It's really important that you get that information right when it's, when it's coming down to important information as to who actually said this, right? And we know that kids with FASD confuse these types of things a lot. Um, reality monitoring is distinguishing between an internally generated source and an externally generated source. So did Jill say that or did I say that? Okay, so differentiating between what you've said or done and what another person has said or done. And then internal source monitoring, which tends to be the most difficult, um, is distinguishing between two internally generated sources. So 
did I say that or did I only think that? So that's that's a tough one because you know, we, we can get confused. That really involves this kind of metacognitive awareness. Did I actually say that? Did I think that? Did I dream that? Did that happen? You know, I'm sure we've all been accused of difficulties with our source memory at times. Um, so there's established paradigms in research to measure source memory in children. It's actually not that difficult. Um, so we use a previously established paradigm, actually that, that I used um, um, in my undergrad research with children with autism, but the paradigm is just basically to measure this type of source um, memory for the external condition, we just have two different experimenters saying different words and then the child after, and the child watches it and the child um, after the fact has to, we ask them, we present them with the word and we ask them which experimenter said that word. So they just have to basically remember which one said it. For the reality condition, the child says the words or an experimenter says the words and then asks after we ask them, did you say that or did the experimenter say that? So we can directly measure that. And then internal, we have the child either say the words or think the word, words. And there's an inhibition aspect there because at first, whenever we ask them to think the words, they just blur them out and then, then they get it. But that's how you measure, you measure the internal monitoring. And that's a paradigm that's used in, in this research quite a bit. So we looked at this with a, a graduate student of mine um, in 19 children with FASD and 30 controlled children aged 6 to 12. Um, and what we found is we did find that um, like typically developing children, children with FASD showed most difficulty when it came to the internal monitoring. That's kind of the hardest one to distinguish whether or not you said something or whether or not you thought it. So we saw kind of the same pattern of, of source and memory performance, but they had much lower performance overall. So um, they were much more likely to confuse the source of the information. Um, and so this is really kind of the first um, documentation of this kind of source memory deficit. Um, they also had more difficulty remembering even if the words were said, um, because we had distractor words in there that weren't part of the original list. So they had difficulty remembering whether or not the words are said, whether or not they were part of the word list, and then the difficulty remembering who said them. So I think you can imagine how this can be um, um, apply to kind of classroom settings and teaching children with FASD that they have this impairment in memory, but they also have a difficulty with remembering the source of the information. So that's something that we kind of need to work on um, to help identify that, maybe using visual cues, things to, to remember where things are coming from. Because if you're getting information wrong or from different sources, it, it could have some significant consequences.